Stanford University. Good afternoon. Are we good? Yep. Yes. Uh, Frank uh, forgot to mention that I also took his class and I survived. So there you go. That's another thing um, I'm proud of on my resume. Um, it's good to be here with you today. Uh, sorry for the late arrival. It was one of those days, as one has when you're in government, uh, where it doesn't start off the way you expect and you're called into last minute meetings, uh, but that's part of the fun. So uh, glad to have arrived safely. Uh, coming here today, I drove one of the Energy Commission's uh, newer cars that we get to you know, take when we go on trips, and this is a Prius. And so, you know, driving out of Sacramento, there weren't that many Priuses, so I didn't get any looks. And then I was on the 80, and kind of someone else driving a Prius gave me that nod, you know, that clean car driver nod. And then as I made my way uh, down to Palo Alto, everywhere I looked, there was a Prius. And so I was no longer special. And so I'd say thank you in advance as someone who works on clean transportation. Uh, thank you for being some of those first adopters of those technologies we're trying to promote. So the general guidance I was given on this talk is to talk about uh, how I got a job and saving the world. Um, so I did get a job, I'm happy to say that, and I'm working on trying to save the world. And I'll give you some introduction into who I am, my background, and then spend most of my time talking about what the California Energy Commission does, and really some of the most important pressing issues I see facing us in the energy sector. Um, I was given 40 minutes, I'll try to be shorter than that, and happy to take any and all questions. Um, so first, let me offer a caveat that I'm representing only my own views today, and I'm not representing necessarily the views of the Energy Commission or my fellow commissioners. Um, since 1974, the Energy Commission has been the state's primary energy planning and policy agency. Our activities focus on assuring that California have energy choices that are affordable, reliable, safe, and environmentally acceptable. With the warren Alquist Act at its core, the Commission permits power plants, designates transmission corridors, assesses current and future energy demand and resources, develops energy efficiency standards, stimulates the research and development of alternative, cleaner electricity and transportation fuels, and regulates energy efficiency. So the commission has five commissioners, uh, and they're supposed to represent specific backgrounds. There's the scientist engineer, the lawyer, the environmentalist, the economist, and the public member. Uh, I'm the public member. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm trying to describe what we do. And so supported by over 600 staff, what commissioners do is provide energy policy guidance to staff, the administration, and the legislature, and make sure that the commission is properly implementing regulations and that our actions uh, incorporate stakeholder views. We discuss and vote on funding decisions, program guidelines, and power plant sightings in a host of public meetings and forums, which you can attend in person in Sacramento, or listen to online. Uh, just in case you're interested in becoming a commissioner, I'll tell you about some of the cooler parts of my job. So the thing I like the most about my job is that I get to go and visit and learn about new technologies. So I visited biofuels plants and wind farms and even got to drive a Tesla Roadster and even one of their cars that had not yet been released. I also get to convene workshops on energy topics I'm especially interested in and get experts like yourselves to come talk to me. I also get an assistant and two advisors and a parking space, which is pretty awesome considering I was a graduate student for the last uh, seven years and was doing all the work myself. Um, so as I mentioned, I serve as a public member. This is an exciting and very humbling role. Across all the areas I work, a common objective of mine is to maximize ratepayer and taxpayer value by continuing to pay attention to both the cost and the ultimate benefit particular resources and technologies provide to ratepayers. I'm acutely aware of the importance of this role as we are facing both the challenges of climate change and economic recovery. So the policy areas I personally work on are wide ranging. I'm lead commissioner on renewables, transportation, natural gas, our integrated energy policy report, which is a biennial report on the state of energy, as well as lead uh, commissioner on Western transmission uh, initiatives and coordination. I'm also lead on about, I think, six natural gas and solar thermal power plant siting cases. Some of my highest priorities are, number one, implementing the 33% renewable portfolio standard. The Energy Commission does verification of resources and designs the regulations for public utilities. Uh, my second highest priority is the development of renewable strategic plan to help address some of the remaining market barriers for renewables. Um, as part of that, development of renewables on state property, 
Another area which I'm highly involved in is the um, rollout of alternative fuels, vehicles, and infrastructure funding. We manage a fund that I'll talk about in a second. It's $100 million annually for alternative fuels and vehicles, and I provide the policy direction with the support of an advisory board on how we spend those funds. Further priorities are mine are strengthening the analytical capabilities of the commission. Um, by mandate and statute, we are a central repository for energy information for the state. Uh, if you're ever looking for data, we have 15,000 web pages, 12 websites, and uh, please use us as a resource. You know, before I delve into more specifics about the state's energy plans and the commission's work, let me spend a few minutes offering you a bit of, about me, a little information about me and my background, and fundamentally how I got to this side of the podium. So I came into the energy space as a teenager with an interest in science, uh, history, and justice, and a desire to protect the environment and specifically the people in it. My older brother gave me two very important gifts in high school, which set me on my path. One was a copy of Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac, and the second was a term paper he wrote on uh, toxic waste at New York's Love Canal neighborhood. These works instilled in me the importance of responsible relationship between people and the land, as well as the interrelatedness of biological, economic, technical, and political forces in, the energy, in energy provision. Prescribing to this, I have pursued a slightly interdisciplinary course of study, work, and civic engagement. My undergraduate training in history and biology gave me a solid framework for considering socioeconomic and scientific issues. It was in graduate school and as an investment banker that I began to understand the economic implications of energy policies, and in particular, the role regulation can play in transitioning the economy to be more green, as well as the unintended consequences that can arise if complex systems such as energy are not examined through a multitude of lenses. My work on green, force, uh, my work on green workforce training uh, for nonprofit aisles in New Jersey enlightened me to emerging clean energy job opportunities, as well as the interest and desire of young people to be trained in this space. My involvement as a board member with TURN, the Utility Forum Network, which is a consumer, uh, California consumer advocacy and utility watchdog group, exposed me um, Front rows, gave me a front row seat to consumer protection concerns and some of the implications that our decisions can have on some of our more marginalized citizens. So a couple of general insights out there uh, for the students out there. I didn't know the exact job I wanted in college or that it even existed. I focused instead on the skills I wanted to amass and the questions I wanted to answer. As you pursue these, the opportunities reveal themselves. A key part of my success has been taking advantage of opportunities university affords in and outside of the classroom. Internships at the California Public Utilities Commission and student research at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab gave me real world context for what I was learning. It was shadowing an energy commissioner as a student was when I realized that this would be a good role for me. Also during my time in graduate school, I developed presentations and gave small talks to whomever would listen, you know, sometimes crowds of three on topics I was interested in. Things that were related to my dissertation, but in themselves were not groundbreaking, but important for me to know. Take advantage of these. This is a way to hone your craft and your skills and be prepared to take that opportunity to talk to larger crowds uh, when it happens. Also be ready for when opportunity strikes. Serving on Turns Board, which is a very big organization, was a very positive experience, again, because I mentioned allowing me to have some insight into consumer protection issues. Well, I got the opportunity because I was working as a graduate student at an economics co conference and I was giving out parking passes. And the new executive director you know, asked me who I was. And I told him I was a graduate student and I proceeded to tell him about my research. That started a conversation that went on for a number of months until I was invited to join the board. So don't be afraid to share your opinion and your thoughts You'd be surprised about how much you already know, even while you're still in school. I think generally my point is that whatever you learn in college can be leveraged in a number of different work environments, whether teaching, policy making, analysis, or advocacy. Expose yourself to different opportunities and talk to professionals in your space. On a practical note, also be willing to take the time it takes to transition to a career you like. I went from making six figures at 24 as an investment banker to continuously making lower each year. I thought there was a negative correlation between my education and my income. Um, 
And then, but eventually I got a job and I'm doing all right now, but it, it took some time. So it's all these experiences that made me a good candidate for an energy commissioner. And I'm happy to talk with all of you about whether those opportunities might be right for you. So now I'm gonna spend the rest of my time talking about some of the state's goals in the clean energy space, as well as some of the challenges I see that we're gonna need all of your help with work, uh, fixing. So governments throughout the world are structuring energy policy to address a myriad of goals. Climate change mitigation, resource diversification and security, reliability and safety, and economic growth and competitiveness. California is no exception, and in fact is a world leader. The state, buoyed by our most recent administrations, has ambitious carbon reduction and energy goals. AB 32 calls for reduction in greenhouse gases to 1990 levels by 2020 and 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. To get there, energy efficiency goals, such as 50% zero net energy homes by 2020 and 50% zero net energy commercial buildings by 2030 and higher energy efficiency building and appliance standards are going to be critical. The Energy Commission and the Public Utilities Commission are working to address key barriers to energy efficiency, including upfront costs and lack of financing, consumer uptake and education, lack of a fully trained and reliable workforce, and lack of coordination across multiple programs. Some of the innovative solutions we're currently seeing are options such as on-bill financing, um, and the role of, of uh, energy efficiency uh, cost into mortgage payments or tax payments. A key mandate for the state right now in energy efficiency is a focus on retrofitting existing buildings to be energy efficient. Over 75% of California's housing stock was built before the first set of energy efficiency standards in the 70s. And so there is much work and low hanging fruit, if you will, in the residential space. Updated triennially, the Energy Commission is developing the newest rounds of our building standards, the Title 24 standards, this year. These standards will require a 15 to 25 percent increase in building efficiency and includes non-energy related greenhouse gas costs and benefits in the cost effectiveness analysis. We'll also be working on simplifying the standards, improving third party verification, and developing a more online, interactive, and user-friendly compliance support. In 2013, California is also implementing new appliance and equipment standards for incandescent lamps, televisions, battery charger systems. You know, battery chargers uh, currently waste about 60% of their energy. Uh, we just passed some regulations to start to deal with that. We've also adopted an order instituting rulemaking, which identifies 26 additional products to investigate for energy efficiency standards during 2012 to 2015. So the other area I work on primarily, in addition to renewables, which I'll spend most of my time, is transportation. Advances in the transportation space will also be critically important for reaching our uh, climate change goals. Nearly 96% of all transportation energy that Californians consume comes from uh, petroleum-based products. And uh, transportation emissions are responsible for 40% of our emissions in the state. The Energy Commission is working to reduce the transportation sector's carbon intensity through management of a 10-year, 100 million annually investment fund for alternative fuels, vehicles, and infrastructure. Established in 2007 by Assembly Bill 118, our funding decisions are informed by a stakeholder advisory committee, and we fund projects across a diversity of transportation forms, including electric vehicles, hydrogen, biofuels, and natural gas. We also award funds to help cities and the state incorporate consideration of alternative vehicles and infrastructure in land use plans and local services. Now, for example, one of the things that I didn't think about before I started this job was that if you're trying to promote electric vehicles, you also need to have um, ADA compliant spaces uh, for the disabled. Um, those are some of the considerations that cities are gonna have to uh, consider as we're now promoting these technologies and uh, incentivizing their rollout. There's a lot of interest in this type of fund. Um, to date, the commission has received over 300 proposals for the funding, requesting upwards of 1.2 billion. And that was 1.2 billion relative uh, to an available amount of funds of 200 million. Indeed, I'd like to say this is kind of one of the most unique and biggest games in the country in terms of supporting alternative fuels and transportation, 
but it's still annually less than Californians spend on gasoline in a day. Um, so we see the significant interest, and we're continuing to try to figure out how do we take this money and leverage private investment as well as federal investment. And I think that's a big part of this job. It's realizing that we can't make the difference completely and alone as government. So what we can do is we can invest, put some of those stimulus funds, and when the market's ready, we expect to have larger investment from the private sector. So now I'll turn to renewable energy, which is a cornerstone of the state's uh, California energy policy, and particularly as it relates to reducing greenhouse gases. In the renewable space, the Energy Commission has an active role in incentivizing, permitting, and researching renewable generation. We manage incentives to existing biomass, solar thermal, small scale wind, fuel cells, and solar on new homes. The commission also plays a key role in the RPS statute by determining the eligibility and verification of generation to meet the RPS. There are nearly 1,000 facilities that have um, obtained RPS eligibility, eligibility through the commission. The commission's responsibility for siting large thermal power plants and transmission planning for renewable energy heavily influenced renewable development in this past year. We built five gigawatts of solar thermal, well, we permitted five gigawatts of solar thermal in the desert in 2010 and 2011. This is quite a feat considering that no solar thermal project of that size had been built since the 1980s. I guess I should make the distinction now that uh, what's sort of unique about the commission's role is that in statute, we permit all thermal facilities. So that would be natural gas, uh, it would be coal, and it would also be solar thermal. Um, we don't permit solar PV in wind. Uh, those projects are permanent at the local level. I think this is probably largely an artifact of initially when the legislation was written in the 70s, uh, these projects were not at scale. Um, so we spent a lot of our time coordinating with uh, local counties and governments on the siting process. In 2011, the state passed Senate Bill X12, uh, a new RPS legislation, which increases RPS procurement requirements from 20% by 2010 to 33% by 2020 expands these requirements to include publicly owned utilities. So now all of the state's utilities are under this law and establishes a preference for renewables that displace California generation and deliver power to California load. This target of 33% is expected to provide 15% of the total greenhouse gas reductions needed to meet our AB 32 goal. In addition to the RPS, the state has an additional distributed solar target of 3,000 megawatts, and Governor Brown has called for the development of 12,000 megawatts of distributed localized generation, as well as accelerated development of energy storage capacity. The governor is known for saying 33% is a floor and not a ceiling. Clearly, a significant amount of renewable energy uh, potential exists and has been developed in California. We're now developing a pipeline of projects both large scale and distributed, and investors seem more willing to develop projects in California. I think we have resources, we have a proven procurement model, and the bureaucracy, although at times challenging, isn't as impenetrable as everyone thought. This should not lead you all to believe, though, that getting to 33% and beyond will be easy. Achieving the goal of 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050 will require the electricity sector uh, to be at least 60% renewable. Such a target requires a coordinated state approach, continued advancements, cost reductions, better certainty about likelihood of project development and financing, scale deployment of energy efficiency, conversion of natural gas plants to renewable fuels, and consumer education. Not all planned megawatts will or should be realized, but this does give us an idea of what we have to work with. Key will be improving integration, site selection, coordination across agencies, and valuing our renewables so we facilitate the right stuff getting built and reduce some of the current uncertainties regarding project viability. I keep bringing up project viability because you'll ask them and they'll say, we have plenty of renewables. Uh, there are a number of projects that have bid into the California ISO to interconnect to the grid. Um, something, very large number, like 70,000 megawatts. But less than half, if that, uh, much smaller will actually be built. And so we have promises of projects to be built, but it takes a lot to get a project built. And even when you get something built, you want to make sure that it doesn't have any unintended environmental or economic consequences. 
and I'll discuss some of the work we're doing in that area in a second. So the commission facilitated a discussion of the state of renewable development in California and the challenges to scaling renewables in a series of workshops in 2011. The information from these workshops is summarized in our 2011 report, Renewable Status and Issues. I think the report's about 340 pages, and that was just enough for us to lay out the challenges. So what we're focusing on this year is what are the solutions? Um, so we're now uh, engaged in a renewable strategic planning process. I think we have about eight workshops scheduled over the next few months um, that will further delve into some of the challenges and think what are some real necessary, perhaps not sufficient, but necessary actions we need to take as a state in the next couple years in order to reach the milestones for a number of these pieces of legislation, which are in 2020. The strategies are gonna focus on the following areas. Prioritizing areas in the state for renewable development, evaluating the cost of renewables beyond technology costs, including the impact on retail rates, minimizing interconnection and integration cost and time, promoting in-state project development and jobs, and incentivizing research and coordination across local, state, and federal programs. Key questions that we're dealing with are how do we cite large-scale renewables to minimize environmental, biological, land use, and cultural resources impacts? How do we better coordinate permitting across state and local federal agencies? I mention this one a lot because it's actually quite a challenge. Uh, we have about four you know, state agencies alone uh, that are involved somehow with energy. And then you add on to that all the local governments and cities. The coordination can be a real challenge. How do we use the expanding markets for renewables to ensure competition, least cost, best fit, as well as equitable distribution of benefits and costs? You know, one of the challenges generally with renewables is that you'll find that the costs aren't distributed equally and neither are the benefits. And as we're investing money from all ratepayers uh, rate and taxpayers, it's important to think about how that distribution occurs. And then finally, how do we scale renewables uh, while maintaining grid reliability? This is one of the main things that keeps me up at night, and I will uh, talk about that more in a second. So let me turn first to the permitting challenge about siding large-scale renewables uh, in environmentally sensitive areas. We would not have been able to permit five gigawatts of solar thermal projects uh, without the coordination uh, that came about from a group called the Renewable Energy Action Team. Uh, REIT team, as it's called, was put together as we we're trying to cite a lot of these projects. And one of the uh, motivations for citing these projects was they had a lot of ARA funding. And so we're taking advantage of some of the federal monies available and uh, trying to get these permitted and uh, breaking ground in order to take available of those funds. The REIT team was composed of the California Department of Fish and Game, the Bureau of Land Management, the Energy Commission, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, when you permit a project, especially in like, the desert area, for example, um, you're engaging with both uh, federal land, state land, and you're also uh, having to deal with endangered and threatened species, which also requires a different set of permits as well. This team met weekly to evaluate our joint permitting process and resolve issues for both thermal and non-thermal plants. Uh, while the process, we're doing a lessons learned now on the process, and while it's not complete, we've learned a couple of things from that experience. Site selection matters, location, location, location. Choosing disturbed sites with minimal sensitive biological and cultural resources can expedite the permitting process by the reducing the time it takes to analyze a project site. The transmission interconnection process remains lengthy and requires close coordination and cooperation with the utilities. We also realize that we need to do a better job about facilitating public involvement in our siting process. Um, although we make available opportunity to participate uh, over the phone or through something we call WebEx, uh, we're looking further into how do we make this more accessible and whether there's opportunity to use video as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, the non-thermal plants are, are permitted by local agencies. And as some of you might be aware, we're seeing a dramatic shift in interest from solar thermal to solar PV as the cost for modules decline. This has taken the Energy Commission, except with certain exceptions, out of the permitting role for some of these facilities. But we continue to play a major role in the planning around the renewables development. And the process I'll discuss in particular here is the work we're doing with the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan. So the DRECP, as we call it, is a collaborative process 
plan to uh, intend it to balance renewable energy development with natural resource conservation. The desert region of California supports many rare, threatened, and endangered plants and wildlife species in natural communities. Uh, if you're in my line of work, you've become very intimate with the desert tortoise and the kit fox, for example. Uh, so for those of you uh, biologists out there, there is plenty of work and demand for your services, particularly as it relates uh, to some of our most sensitive desert uh, species, as well as um, some avian species when it comes to uh, wind facilities. So in order to have, the, the decision here was to try to have a more ecosystem-friendly permitting approach. And the approach includes a regional conservation strategy, which allows us to address climate change from a species and habitat perspective, while also focusing on habitat connectivity. Signing on to a memorandum of understanding to work on this DRACP, we have the state agencies, we have the local governments, we have developers, we have environmentalists. Having all the people who have an interest in developing this resource, but developing in a safe manner, they're getting together, working together, and figuring out are there certain areas that we can say are better for development versus others? This process allows the permitting agencies to move away from a project by project, species by species conservation strategy. This should result in more effective species conservation, upfront knowledge of mitigation requirements, and increased permitting certainty for developers. I think one of the challenges is when you're signing a permit, uh, when, you're, when you're signing a power plant, state agencies go out, they look at what sensitive resource, uh, sensitive species there are. Um, sometimes the amount will be a surprise to us and to the developer and having to design the right mitigation. Because fundamentally what we need to do is site plants and minimize adverse risk and harm. If we can do that and we have mitigation we can suggest, they go ahead and build the plant. If they don't, then we don't approve it. So this is doing some of that work up front so we're not dealing with it on a case by case. Once approved, DRACP will streamline the permitting process from state and federal wildlife agencies for a 30 to 40 year period for the construction, operation, and maintenance of um, renewable projects, as well as for transmission facilities. So now I'll turn to cost, because that's always an issue, especially for those uh, economists out there. And the higher cost of renewables, especially without a higher carbon penalty and electricity prices, is a key barrier to renewable development. Historically, technologies such as solar thermal and uh, solar uh, photovoltaic have levelized costs that are greater than those of conventional generation. However, recent contract bids show that this is changing. And indeed, solar and wind costs are at their lowest level to date. In addition, in the past, distributed generation projects were considered more costly due to transaction costs and lack of economies of scale. However, standardization of contract terms and the way photovoltaics are manufactured and sold have affected bids for distributed generation systems and have resulted in solicitation bids um, below the market price reference, which is a you know, standard gas plant. Additional research is still, however, needed to drive down the cost of renewables, and especially for less commercialized or uh, less widely deployed renewables, such as dairy digesters, for example, that can be deployed in a diversity of regions and offer opportunities for baseload generation and waste reduction. The state continues to support renewables through a variety of subsidy programs, um, but the ultimate goal is to have these industries be self-sustaining and for subsidies to continue to decline. A further overarching goal is to have, as I mentioned, costs and benefits distributed in an equitable manner. So regardless of renewables, it's important to remember that energy costs are expected to rise in the coming years due to needed investment in our aging distribution system and infrastructure. Care does need to be taken to manage the rate impacts while still moving forward to develop the clean energy that's been mandated. I think finally, in any discussion of costs of renewables, it's important to recognize that renewables provide important benefits that have not been adequately quantified or rewarded. For example, you take something like biomass. Biomass plants can use um, waste wood from forest. Clearing that waste wood helps reduce fire hazard. You know, that's not something that we incentivize as part of our procurement programs. Do think it's important, however, and we've done this in a workshop a couple weeks ago, to really get a sense of what these other benefits are, and at least talk about them and acknowledge them. Generally, I'm supportive of any procurement strategy that promotes a diversified portfolio. You know, I'm, 
fond of saying, you know, I think about it like a potluck, right? And if you don't tell people what to bring to a potluck, the first three people who come with a bottle of wine, great, you got wine. If eight people come with wine, you have no food, you got a problem. And so it's important, some unintended consequences. You can laugh, that was kind of funny. Um, so <laughs> there you go. Um, so, <laughs> and you know, we all have different roles in that potluck. You know, the PUC tells us how much the potluck can cost. What the Energy Commission will tell you, we'll tell you, okay, that guy should bring the cake because he's next to a really good bakery. Don't have the guy bring it from Safeway. Yeah. What ISO will tell you, the independent system operator that manages the grid, they tell us what time the potluck's gonna start and where it's gonna be. But ultimately, diversity is important and we wanna hear from people what they wanna bring as well. Um, so having that diverse portfolio is gonna require us continuing to support some of these less commercialized uh, technologies. So I'm going to turn now to integration. I think this is the final topic I have. Careful siting and lower cost renewables are only a part of what we need uh, in order to deliver this power to the grid. Grid operators have it tough. They must utilize California's complex system of power resources and generation to instantaneously and continuously match demand. There was no other industry that I can think of that has a harder task. As well, okay, that's not true. But when it comes to matching and timing, as more intermittent resources like renewable energy are added to the grid, such as wind and solar, it becomes increasingly challenged to integrate variable resources while maintaining grid reliability, safety, and security. You know, to give you an example of some of the challenges that we're facing, um, we have a significant amount of wind generation on the system now. Um, I think the system operator observed in one hour the 800 megawatts of wind falling off the grid in terms of supply, just because there wasn't the wind there. So what they have to do is now come up with 800 megawatts of alternative generation so that demand is met. You know, that, is an, that is an increasingly challenge, that is an increasingly difficult challenge. Integration, however, is not a new problem, uh, but the scale and diversity of the resources is increasing. So gas-fired units, energy storage, and demand response are key to maintaining reliability. The California ISO appropriately calls these three resources partners for success in renewable integration. And one of my key interests, as I mentioned, is getting a real handle on what the all-in cost of renewables are. Because it's not just the solar PV module that has its cost. It's what other additional energy you're going to need as well in order to make sure that there's a product that's able to deliver energy on a 24-7 basis. In addition, to energy store, in addition to energy storage, demand response, and gas-fired units, better weather and operational forecasting will be necessary to reduce the uncertainty over the availability of and need for resources. So if we knew when the wind was gonna drop, it'd be easier to figure out and have available resources to meet that need. So currently to deal with integration, California relies on the flexibility of its existing generation fleet, uh, particularly large hydropower and natural gas plants uh, to get, integrate the renewables online. Going forward, the system may no longer be able to rely on excess capacity and rules design because of the enormous growth of variable renewable resources. Moreover, although our existing gas fire generation will play an increasing role, potentially even more so with the recent uh, decline in gas prices, we still need to make sure that we are using facilities that have the necessary flexibility, location, and minimal greenhouse gases. So for example, one of the things I've heard is that if you're taking some of these gas plants and you're trying to operate them faster, have them ramp faster, be more responsive, there are higher emissions that come from that activity and that that's not operating them efficiently. So for those of you who are interested in uh, gas plants, I think there's a real opportunity and need for research in this area because we're gonna need gas plants that do a lot more than they do now. We also need to make sure that the fuel for the gas plants is uh, reliably and environmentally sourced. Um, we're watching the fracking uh, discussion and literature with interest. So the California ISO has taken steps to improve integration, and this is a key objective for them uh, as we're developing renewables as a state. Um, we also have supported uh, work in this area through research, and uh, we continue to do so. Um, we'll be having a workshop uh, on this topic again in June, and specifically there will be a panel that deals with uh, natural gas plant operating characteristics. Again, if interested, I recommend uh, calling in and having a listen. 
And so finally, another strategy, again, that can ease our integration challenges is having a diverse renewable portfolio. Um, some resources, such as biomass, are more baseload. Um, some have more flexible operating characteristics. Uh, we need to, we pay to pay attention to this and take advantage of this natural variability. So I've only been able to briefly touch upon today a number of the activities the state is engaged in uh, to reach our clean energy goals. Uh, but as you can already have a sense of, they're complex. But I think they're ultimately solvable questions. You know, a key challenge is the variety, I think, of uncertainty that exists in our system. Um, we have uncertainty about supply. We have uncertainty about demand. You take something like electric vehicles, uh, we're getting a, we don't know necessarily how much people will adopt them, right? And so it's hard to plan for a system where you have to invest now and have the infrastructure be ready 10 years out to really know what people are going to want in 10 years. Um, we also have uncertainty about technology costs. Uh, you always get projections that prices are coming down next year, you know, five years out, and it's hard to plan around that. Um, so we really need researchers in this space who are able to develop models that are able to analyze complex questions, often with a lot of unknowns, um, as well as uh, those who can help us reduce some of the uncertainty, for example, around some of these technology projections. Having this uncertainty poses an inherent risk in my job. So in short, there's a lot to be done over the next few decades. Uh, the Energy Commission is hiring. Um, with retirement and new positions, 20% of our workforce uh, will be new this year. Um, I think you're to continue to see that trend. Uh, the population of state workers is aging, um, as with many institutions, and we'll be looking for new blood and new energy uh, to support the work we're doing. Ultimately, I think this is great work. I mean, this is why I traded in my briefcase in 2005 for a book bag and went back to graduate school at UC Berkeley. Um, and I also like to joke, too, that if the stress of the job doesn't do me in, that the governor appointed someone of my age, and I won't share that age because I'm old enough to not want to share my age. Uh, he appointed me because I'll likely be around here in 2020 and 2050 when we're supposed to reach some of these milestones. That leaves me with a grave sense of responsibility and purpose. And, but I'm committed to it, and I hope that some of you are as well. So with that, I will stop and take questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Please, if you have questions, please do that. You know, we talked about Title 24, which is, uh, to my mind, a very important tool. Uh, and you said that you would, you would uh, make it easier. Okay. You would make it easier for people, you know, to uh, uh, to apply for the permit online and so forth, but you know, content-wise, what, what do you do differently? So, what you saying? What should we do differently, content-wise? Yeah, I mean, will you uh, will you enforce it uh, more, or will you um, put higher standards uh, in there? Or what so, you... yeah, so we update the standards every three years to become higher, if you will. So this round will be fifteen to twenty-five percent higher than the last round. Um, the interesting thing, though, about the uh, energy efficiency for buildings in particular is that we've been hearing from, at least I've been hearing from builders more, that a need to focus on um, actual plug loads within the building. Because increasingly, in terms of new homes, we are making uh, the envelope more efficient. Um, but a lot of power is being utilized by computers and technology and such. And so we're trying to, I think of they're a nice complement to the appliance work. So nothing drastically different with the energy efficiency standards. Uh, just uh, increasing, increasing the standards as well as thinking about how do we move towards you know, zero net energy homes. And that's going to be a combination of both the efficiency as well as having distributed generation opportunities available. Okay. Did I answer your question? You, know, you can have if, another go. If you go, if you go to zero energy, I mean, you need to uh, you need to install some PV systems or anything, something that creates energy. You know? Right. So, and, and that's that's not included in the perimeter of Title Twenty Four, as I understand it today. That is correct. But you know, Title Twenty Four is complemented by other programs. So, another program that we manage at the Commission is the New Solar Homes Partnership Program, and uh, that provides an incentive for putting solar on new homes, and you get a higher so. And there's an embedded energy efficiency requirement in there that in order to get um, the first tier of incentive, you have to be 15% better than Title 24. 
then you can get a higher incentive if you're 30% better than Title 24. And so I think there's a nice synergy there. Um, thank you for your talk. My question is about regulatory coordination. OK. You mentioned all the layers of policy goals, uh, RPS, efficiency, mm -hmm. um, Governor Brown's uh, DPS goals, mm -hmm. things like once through pooling coming in will affect California. Yeah, I didn't even system. touch on that because that's not our regulation, but yeah. And then you have four or five different agencies who sort of share responsibility. You know, you work on the integrated policy planning, mm -hmm. figure out who's going to do that and how. If you were emperor of California, what would be at the top of your list for how to improve that agency coordination or to cut through that and to make it easier to be able to enact and reach all these different policy goals that are out there on the regulatory side? <laughs> um, let me see. I think about how, how I want to approach this. I mean, part of, I think what a real practical answer would be. Um, first, I'll say I think we're starting to do it which is just talking to each other more. Um, the biggest challenge I face isn't so much that I don't know uh, the other commissioners at the PUC or, or that I'm not on a positive relationship with them. It's just finding the time to frankly do it. You know, we have so many goals and mandates that we're implementing as a state with a workforce that went through furloughs, you know, uh, that has lost a number of people, had job, you know, had positions that were lost during the recession. So we're doing more with less. Um, so, you know, what I would do to help with coordination would be one, hire more government employees, um, because that allows you know, more people to be having these conversations and really having the time to think. And then I would also re kind of require, if you will, some type of uh, joint retreat, some planning to have um, all the decision makers get together and really talk about what they are working on. And I'll speak to another point on this, which is we do have a number of agencies working on different things. And sometimes it seems like there's overlap. But I think it's a good system in that I think it's important to have different bodies prioritizing different things. Um, so reliability is very important to me. But so is protecting the environment. If you had, and so are cost. Who's to say which one's more important? Which one will be more important to different people? So what you have with these different agencies is that you have them focused on that perspective as this is the most important to us. And that means someone's looking out for that issue. Because I think otherwise you run the risk, if you're trying to address them all at the same time, that you're not going to get any of them done. Um, so that's you know, one thing I would do. And uh, that's that'd be about it. And I think the other uh, thing, Governor Brown is a strong leader. You know, he has made, uh, I like the appointments he's made. And I'm not just speaking that because I'm one. Um, but you know, I think it's people <laughs> who care about the issues and, um, and who know their craft. And uh, so hopefully we'll see some better coordination. Do you have any suggestions? Cause I will definitely take suggestions on this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the other thing I'll mention to you, because you, you brought up once through cooling, is that we have a number of regulations that partly do happen in silos. And there's a number of pieces of legislation that we're all implementing. And I do have some concerns about how they all interact and ultimately how feasible they are and the cost. And uh, it'd be great to have some big equilibrium model that could put all these policies in and really figure out the impact on well, no, you know, company by company, plant by plant, location basis. But we don't have that. And uh, so part of what I think we're trying to do is just each of us identify, hey, you know, if we do this, let me talk to my colleague at a different agency first, just to see what the impact of what we're doing will be on, uh, on their policy. And more of that needs to be done. Uh, Hi. You mentioned a number of times, you know, equity issues and, you know, who benefits and who pays, particularly with regard to, you know, increased renewable energy use. Could you sort of amplify on that, you know, sort of what, what, what are the, some of the answers and issues and solutions regarding that issue? So I guess, uh, I, I'll give a couple examples of the issues that have come up. Um, we've had a lot of interest in our forums uh, from environmental justice communities uh, with an interest in developing renewables uh, in their communities, which have been disproportionately affected by the siting of fossil facilities. Um, and there's a desire not only to 
not bear disproportionate negative impacts, but also to uh, receive proportionate or even perhaps uh, disproportionate because of historical reasons benefits. Um, but when we look at, for example, solar PV and how it's being installed in the state, it's still expensive enough that it is the middle class or the wealthier who can afford it. And so we have everyone paying into the incentives, but we only have a certain uh, subset of the population that's actually able to benefit directly from them. Now we all as a society will benefit from the reduced greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but that's not as comforting if you're also you know, putting cash out. So one of the questions is how do we get renewables in these communities? Um, but a challenge with just say, you know, focusing incentives in that area will be that, well, we also want to put distributed PV uh, in areas where the grid, the distribution grid is most appropriate to accept it. Well, that happens to be areas with a newer distribution system. Those are the suburban areas that are being developed more inland. It's not necessarily in the inner cities where some of these communities uh, have resided. And so with all renewables, there are, I think there's a couple levels of benefits. There's private benefits, there's electricity system benefits, and then there's state benefits. Uh, there's ratepayer benefits, there's taxpayer benefits. They're not necessarily all the same. So that would be uh, you know, one example. Um, another is that there are certain, we have certain geographical resources uh, that are superior for renewable development. Um, solar uh, in the desert is great, uh, wind in the Tehachapis. Um, but those resources don't exist to the same amount, say in the Central Valley. So what are the renewables we can bring to the Central Valley? Um, so there's been a real interest from farmers in the ag community and opportunities for dairy digesters, for example, um, being able to use um, animal waste from their farms as um, resources. So then you can invest in dairy digesters, but then there are some issues with local air pollution from them and local air contaminants. And so as you're trying to address one issue, maybe it's having broader access to renewables, you also might have some additional unintended consequences uh, like uh, you know, hot spots of local air pollution. So we're trying to still figure it out. You know, I think part of it for me, frankly, is making sure that everyone's at the table and involved in the conversation um, because we're making these plans in real time. Yeah. I love your analogy of the, uh, the commission organizing a pop-up. I think that's great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, how do you go about today making decisions between different areas like renewables versus energy efficiency programs? I mean, clearly the technologies are changing in each, so you, you have to make that decision fairly regularly. How do you go about doing it? Um, I'll, you, I'll say a couple things about that. So we, the way we're organized as commissioners is that we each lead on different areas. So uh, even though we all vote on something, in terms of uh, giving policy guidance along the way and presenting something to the commissioners, we are siloed. And so I'm not lead on energy efficiency, so that helps me make my decision. That I focus on renewables in my decision-making process. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but I'll say, first of all, the state... Uh, back in 2003, I believe, the Energy Action Plan uh, was developed, and it was a uniquely coordinated effort between the Energy Commission, the PUC, uh, and the ISO. Um, maybe ARB was in there, I'm not sure. And it set a loading order for resources for the state. Number one is energy efficiency. Um, I think demand response might be next, and then renewables, um, and then it's uh, cleaner fossil fuels. And so I always start from that perspective. You know, Have we done what we need to do on energy efficiency, for example. Um, and But then to you made the general, you know, I think your point overall is there were trade-offs. You know, we have limited money and how do we invest? And I think what the state's approach has been so far is to invest in them all um, and see what happens. There's too many people I don't want to pick now. <laughs> Oh, uh, does your agency get involved in demand-based pricing for electricity? And if so, what can we expect in the next three to five years on that? So no, and so I'm going to leave it at that. I mean, <laughs> the, the Public Utilities Commission is more involved with pricing. And so I guess I'll just comment on the difference between us. So the Public Utilities Commission uh, sets the um, rates and determines what's uh, allowed to be collected in terms of cost recovery for the investor-owned utilities. And they represent 75% of the state's load. The remaining 25% of the load um, uh, is provided through publicly owned utilities, of which there are 48. And um, so my interactions, I mostly work with the public utilities, which is kind of hard sometimes to make rules of 48 different bodies, but that's another story. Um, so we are not directly involved in it. We will probably touch upon the topic in our workshop when we're talking about costs and rates. Um, 
I think there's still continuous interest in it. Uh, I'll also say um, with the introduction of smart meters, I think there's some more capability for some other pricing schemes. Uh, but rates are very political, as is, as is electricity pricing. And so um, I'm interested to see uh, what results. So uh, clearly, your focus is, is here in California. But this commission is often at a leadership position. Right? Uh, can you talk about relationships with other states, other pieces of government? You know, how, how, how much time do people spend? People come here to see what's going on. Do you go there? What, you know, because after all, this stuff has got to be more than just California, unless we leave. Right, right. Yeah. No, I'll, um, yeah, I'll answer that in a couple ways. Uh, we do coordinate with other states and many times often in a leadership role. So there's lots of different subgroups. So, um, you know, I'm involved with some initiatives with Washington and Oregon. It's called the Pacific Clean States Alliance. Um, and they have more progressive goals, probably similar to ours. And so we're thinking about what can we do in a coordinated fashion. But the challenge is that California is just so ahead of other states um, that I think primarily what we do is we, we show, OK, well, we've already addressed that issue. Or here's the challenges we face. Here's what worked. And encourage them to not repeat same mistakes to take our best practices. Uh, because ultimately, mo much of our energy policy is focused on reducing greenhouse gases. So if we can get the other states and the federal government to do that, uh, then there's less value to the work that we're doing. Um, I just came back from a series of meetings with um, states in the uh, WEC, which is our coordinating council, and uh, because we're working on transmission issues together. Um, and in the WEC, you really have a diversity of states. And, you know, you've got every divide you can imagine, rural, urban, you know, red state, blue state, and really significant coal interest. I mean, within this area, you have the biggest renewable state, California, and you also have a number of states with n over 90% of their income comes from uh, coal or gas. Um, so it makes sometimes for strange bedfellows, uh, but we're working on it. Um, that's the other point I will make about interstate interaction. And then some of the products that we make are used by other states. So one of the things the Energy Commission does is we maintain a list of eligible solar PV modules, for example, um, that you can use in our programs. And then if you go to other states and look at their websites for their solar PV programs, you have to get a module that's approved by the Energy Commission. You know? So you know, there's definitely, I think, some spillover. And, uh, and we try to coordinate. We don't travel that much. There was a limit put on us uh, to do any out-of-state travel, so it's pretty hard to get that done. But we do have delegations that come visit all the time, and they're always surprised about uh, how many different agencies we have working on issues. We had a question back here. Yeah. Uh, for anyone interested in how this team, all this stuff really is, join the Sierra Club, sit in on our Monday morning, Monday noontime conference calls for the California Energy Commission of Sierra Club, and you'll see all the different crazy organizations and regulations and people involved with California energy. Yeah. It's really Byzantine. But uh, my, my question really is, so join the club, join the Sierra Club. Uh, if, you, if we're paying for a permitting, a permitted project in the desert, it's a five gigawatt solar thermal plant, and knowing the huge thermodynamic losses of solar thermal, and knowing the large losses in transmission from the desert to the loads, why are we still doing this? Well, I'll say it's five gigawatts across, like, I think, 10, 11 facilities. No, nothing, no plant is any well, that works. <laughs> at, at, this, at this size. I mean, I would say, for so there's thermodynamic losses in all generation resources. So you know, pick your poison. So I think that's number one. It's a free fuel, right? So you don't have. Hmm? See, what, I'm, what I'm getting at yeah. is inconsistent with what the governor says and what we're doing with local solar on existing structures. There's no land requirement. There's no impact with species. All of that. And with 100,000 businesses and maybe a, 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 you know, a 30th of all the homes in California with PV at the current 20% efficiency, you could do that better. Yeah, um, better. It comes about scale. Right, which is why I'm supportive of a diversified portfolio that has both large scale as well as DG. So the governor's plan calls for 20,000 megawatts of new generation, of that 8,000 being uh, large scale and 12,000 being um, DG. 
acknowledging some of the points you've raised, but ultimately in terms of cost, the larger projects are going to have uh, the lower cost on a kilowatt hour, megawatt hour basis. I think a really sweet spot that we need to exploit and explore better is around the 20 megawatt size. You know, something that has enough scale, um, has some of the cost reductions, but also has some of those local benefits. But currently, in terms of even PV deployment, you rarely see anyone that's got a PV system that offsets all their entire load. And everyone wants to have the PV system, but they want to have the big utility to back it up. And so I think it's about right now having that combination. Also, our grid is just not designed for distributed generation 100%. And when we have to, we're designed to have centrally located plants that send energy out. We also have a transmission system we've invested in. And so yeah, I think you've made some really valid, those are some valid points. And that's, I think we're learning as a state, as we develop these projects in the desert and in other areas, some of the costs and challenges that come with it. You know, no, no energy source is without its impacts. It's just different types of impacts. Um, and so a mix will be useful. Well, there is a qualitative difference between making thousands of acres of desert land and converting it to mirrors. Right. I mean, I'm an engineer, so I mean, I, I wouldn't choose that because I know we're losing 60 percent of the energy at least in a solar thermal plant plus 10 percent transmission. And we have to build the transmission lines. We have to do all that. So right. this doesn't really make a heck of a lot of sense yeah. scientifically or economically. Yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, I think at this point, though, I'll say we still need a mix that there is no resource, whether both by attribute or size, that's going to meet all of our needs. So one last well, both, both. I'll, I'll be quick with the answer. Geothermal, how does that fit into the mix? It does, it fits in significantly. So geothermal represents um, a larger portion of renewables to date. Um, we'll continue to see geothermal development, but I think you're going to see some of the other technologies uh, increasing in size more. And partly that is just a function of, one, what's already been developed, two, um, there's a lot of exploration costs you have to do with geothermal. It's not as, you know, you don't really know what you're going to get in terms of a megawatt capacity of a facility until you have invest a lot. And so one of the uh, programs that we manage is something called GERDA, which is like geothermal research, something or another. And it provides um, incentives for exploration for geothermal. Uh, so I think you'll still see more of it. There's a lot in um, Nevada's developing a lot of geothermal in their north, which could ultimately be good for the state. I mean, one thing I will mention about that, what comes to mind is, also, in terms of our ability to uh, use renewables in this state, we have this interesting thing. We have a lot of potential in the south, uh, but a lot of demand uh, for the resources in the north. And we don't have very good transmission going south to north. So one of the models you could perhaps envision would be we do a lot of generation in the south, export uh, to other states, import power, renewable power uh, to the north as well. So we have, um, we have a number of uh, kind of challenges and possible solutions to deal with this issue. There was another question? Oh. What do you think about uh, the future of wave power? Oh, it's interesting that you brought that up. We're, actually, we're going to talk about it in a workshop. That's using my response to everything we're going to talk about in a workshop. Um, I think wave power is not here for us now, um, but I think it's interesting. So, uh, and like I said, if we need to get to 60% renewables for 2050, we don't know the technologies that are going to get us there yet. We've got a set right now that will get us to 33%, but I'm expecting and hoping for some significant advancements going forward. One of the things I think about with wave power, though, is we interact a lot, you talk about interaction with other agencies, with the, um, with the military. Um, the military is a very large employer and resident in the state of California. And they do a lot of their training in uh, some of the areas where we want to site renewables, like desert areas, for example. And there's a lot of activity uh, under the ocean layer and submarines. And so they're, they're definitely concerned with making sure that wave power does not interfere with training exercises, for example. Again, so yeah, all these types of issues. But it's, still, it's interesting. All right. Well, we don't, we, we don't want to go too far over. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.